Welcome back to Stylized Station, a platform dedicated to teaching beginners how to create game art. As the title suggests, in today's video, we're going to learn how to create stylized PBR weapons from scratch. From modeling to sculpting and texturing, we're going to cover everything you need to know so you can make your own weapons, models, and assets without getting lost in the workflow. Speaking of texturing, if you want to learn how to master stylized texturing using Substance Painter, Feel free to join our latest course, where you'll learn how to create beautiful stylized textures from scratch, including anime and Studio Ghibli style textures. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to consider getting the course. Now let's get into the video. Hello. In this short breakdown, I'll go over the steps in creating a stylized PBR game asset. Um, I'll mainly focus on the sculpting parts. Um, I'll try to show you some of the techniques and, and tricks I used in creating a, a stylized sculpt. So I'll start off with a with a simple blockout. Um, usually I won't use this for for low poly. So after I'm I'm done with the sculpt, I'll do a fast retopology. So in this stage, I don't really care about the topology or or poly count. Um, I just prefer to do some of the more complex shapes in, in Blender instead of ZBrush, just because I'm a bit faster here. So parts like this, which, which might be a bit tricky to do in ZBrush, or even this, I just feel like I have more control here. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll do the, the whole block out to just to see the size and um, I guess the the volumes, but if I miss something here, um, I'll, I'll, I can still add it in ZBrush. I will usually subdivide this, so I get it to to slightly higher poly count before I import it in in ZBrush. I feel like here you, you can add some supporting edges uh, to really get the the shape you want, even though this is gonna change quite a lot in ZBrush. I still like you put it into this stage. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll do this for, for all the parts. One thing to note here is I like to keep the parts separate. That especially counts for um, counts for parts where the material changes. So for instance, um, this part is going to be gold and then this part is going to be metal. So I really want to have them separate so I can scope them um, one at a time and, and really establish a, a clear um, transition between them. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that for every part. Even if the, if it's the same material, I still like to have it separate. Um, that's something you can do in, in ZBrush. But yeah, I think here it's just easier since it's um, all very basic shapes. And once I have that done, I'll just export this and, and take it into ZBrush. So this is the, uh, the final sculpt in ZBrush. I go, I'll go over um, steps, how I get to this point. Um, I'll make some of the the details. So this is what I start with. This is just the the block out, export it, and then import it in ZBrush. I will usually work with Dynamesh. Um, depends on what kind of details I'm trying to add. But yeah, I'll, I'll normally uh, work with, at least in the first stages, with Dynamesh. And one of the uh, very useful tools I find in, in ZBrush is Deformer. So I use this a lot when, when doing stylized sculpt sort of like proportional editing but with a little bit more control we can really push shapes um, start to get some more stylized feel to it yeah I'll, I'll use this a lot for for different parts um, when I get the, the general shape I want I will usually start working on the on the edges um, at, at the early stages, 
I'll often use um, symmetry just to speed it up. So I'll start with something like trim dynamic. Just take some of the edge off. So it doesn't look doesn't look so perfect. I'm gonna do the steps a bit faster than I normally would. So yeah, I might start adding some some details here as well. So maybe maybe I want a chip here and I'll use H polish usually. But intensity a bit. I'll keep uh, dyna meshing, especially when I'm adding um, details that change the topology a bit more. So yeah, I'm I'm just getting sort of a general feel for it. Um, if I'm adding like, very large details, I'll normally uh, turn off the the symmetry. Yeah, that that depends on what kind of assets you are working on and what your limitations are. Yeah, since this is just a, a practice piece, I'll, I I don't care too much about texture space, so I I can have the the whole model unwrapped. So yeah, um, this is this is mainly it for the first stage, and I'll go through the whole model, um, do this on on every part. Uh, I start thinking about materials here. So if this is metal. I want to have certain characteristics and then use them on all the parts that are metal and then do the same for cloth and, and, and gold and so on. So yeah, I'll get it to, to sort of this stage. Um, it's, it's still very simple. There's some edge damage. Um, and then the next step to get it here, it's usually going to be some surface details. Um, you can use H polish for this as well, but you have to do it really, really subtle, so it doesn't doesn't change too much. Also, it it can cause some problems on on curved surfaces. You can also use standard brush. Maybe bump down intensity. Just trying to make something that sort of resembles hammered stone. Let's go in and do really small small surface details and then I can balance and balance them out with maybe trim dynamic just yeah adding adding details all over the model I'll also focus more on the top of the model just because it's it's seen more and it's it's more important so I'll spend a little bit more time on on the top as well as maybe the, the gold parts. Also working on the transitions. So the the base um, joins with the with the handle here. So we wanna have some some surface damage on this part. Just go in with H polish. Trying to make some variation so not every dance this um, is gonna be the same. Balance it out with trim dynamic. Maybe add a another small dent here maybe that's a bit too much I'll just polish it out it's a bit more trim dynamic I like this might work I might also add some some larger surface details so I'll go in again with H polish then I'll swap to planner planner really sort of gives definition uh, it takes away a lot of a lot of your sculpt so it can be a bit overpowering sometimes that but adds really nice visible details take away some more and then again trim dynamic Just working it till you get something you like. You can also use warp crack 
sort of tie in some of the damage. Then I also like to use uh, Flatten Edge, which is a very strong brush. And again, it just sort of um, adds a bit more definition to your details. Start looking a bit too realistic. Um, it loses some of its stylization. Then you just try again, maybe smooth a bit, or maybe make the um, the details a bit stronger. Just go again, add some definition. Um, I also sometimes use alphas with planner, so I'll go with a square alpha. Then it makes even stronger details. A lot of it is just balancing, adding, taking away, just trying to get something, um, something that you like. That's even a bit too much. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just keep adding details, um, add surface details, and then sort of the the last step I do. So this is the the final one. Um, I really like having uh, clear transitions between between parts. So it sort of tapers in where where the gold part comes, um, as well as on the top, because it it just looks a bit strange if it's just um, sort of glued on. Um, so to get this, I would usually I'll just go with the mask. Then you can use transparency. Just mask it out. Then I'll invert the mask. Oops. Maybe pull it in a bit. There we go. And then exactly the same process as for edges just trim dynamic and then H polish maybe you wanna add some cracks yeah it just depends a lot on what kind of material you're using. Maybe it's, it's peeling off a bit. Yeah, you're just um, just working it in steps. Um, that's my preferred way. Um, until you get a, you get a finished sculpt. There's also one, one step I, I normally take. So once I'm at at a stage where I feel I have enough details and I'm I'm close to to finished, I'll start using the deformation tools. So I'll go in inflate. Um, again, might have done it here already. Let's say uh, if you have a lot of sharp edges, I feel like they don't really translate that well into um, when baking. It, it sort of looks strange. So I'll go into inflate and then polish. You can set polish to two or three. Maybe I'll go to here. Then it really rounds off all the edges. Um, right now they look too soft. So to get some of the definition back, go into clay polish and usually just on default settings, just go for clay polish. And it gives really nice definition to some of the details you've um, you've made. You, know, you can play with sharpness or, or how soft you want this clay polish to be. Yeah, I think it's really nice tool to balance out your your sculpts. Um, yeah, and then once you're done with it, 
you just uh, export it as your as your high poly. Uh, one thing to add when baking, I'll sometimes separate some of the parts. So like this trinket here, I'll just pull it away so it doesn't bleed onto the model, especially because I want it to to move later. So depending on how the mace is going to be positioned, I might want it here, and I don't want to have like ambient occlusion from from this position. So yeah, I'll just move it away. Um, you can do this for a lot of parts. You can still fix some of this later. But yeah, for for some simple stuff like this, I'll just um, just move it here. Um, so yeah, that's that's the high poly done. So for baking, I'll use Substance Painter. Um, yeah, I'll just do a simple bake. Uh, check if there's any any major issues. Um, and then I'll, I'll start with, with the textures. I kept it fairly simple here. Just use a, a base color. Then I add some ambient occlusion. Um, I try to exaggerate a little bit with it and then take it down if I have to. But I feel for, for stylized textures, um, it, it makes sense to me uh, to push it a little bit. And then for highlights, I'll go with the with a pass of like soft highlights, um, yeah, just very soft. Then an another pass of sharper. Um, I'll add some some cavity, um, some some values. So if you want to have it uh, brighter on top than on bottom. And then for this, I exported um, the base color, took it to Photoshop. And just added some details. Just trying to add some characters to it, make it a little bit more interesting. I think if you if you really push your scope, you you don't have to do this. If you have a lot of surface details, yeah, I just added some by hand, um, and I'll just use exactly the same process for um, for all the materials. I also add um, roughness and metallic um, as a separate channels just to have a little bit more control with it um, so yeah I'll, I'll do the same process for, for all of them you can try experimenting with some masks as well um, but yeah I, I kept it really simple here okay so the last part that I feel a lot of people sort of rush through just because you're getting close to finishing your project and um, yeah maybe get a little too hasty um, I feel like rendering can really sort of elevate your your work. Um, can really make your the high points shine, and then maybe some stuff that you didn't pay too much attention to, you can try to hide it a little bit. So yeah, I think it's very important to spend some time on on lighting and and rendering. Um, I tried using a, a simple setup here, so. I just have a three-point light um, setup. I'll start with a uh, with a skylight. Um, keep it low brightness so you get more control with with your lights. And then I use one warm light coming from the front. Um, then I use another fill light just to sort of balance it. Um, we'll go with a with a cooler color just a little bit. I don't want to influence the textures too much but still I, I want to have a little bit of effect. And then I'll place this um, on the opposite side of the of the key light but still coming from the front. And then just for some added effect I think it adds a little bit of drama. Just, um, just a rim light. Um, and yeah then you try to balance balance all these lights um, the key light is, is the strongest one and then the fill light is yeah just play with it um, see what details it brings out yeah I'll, I'll keep it low usually um, and same for, for the rim light um, can push it even more um, then as far as the effects go I really like using depth of field. I think it has, adds a nice effect. Um, 
I, I drained it up quite a lot on this one just because I really want to focus the eye um, on top but yeah you can you can play with um, far blur and, and near blur just yeah until you get something something you like um, the other effects I I don't put too much of them I think they add an, a nice um, a nice punch to it um, bloom and uh, sharpen uh, but yeah, I just I keep it quite low, um, so so they don't blow out the image. Um, another thing you can you can do with with Marmoset is um, camera movements. So if you wanna um, have more dynamic presentation, you can just record a quick camera movement um, video, something like like this. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting for people to see. So it's not all static. Yeah, I think I think that's all. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to message me on on ArtStation. I'd I'd love to help you out. Yeah, that's all. See ya.